one person here? Come on now. Good evening. It's good to see you tonight. Thank you to those joining us online. I'm going to take prayer requests and praises before uh, Brother Mike comes to open the word tonight. So who will be first? They're getting a microphone, so I'll give them a minute. Uh, a couple prayer requests that I know of already. Um, Alberto Bouchot, who is uh, one of our Spanish members, he's in the Spanish ministry, very active, is a great help back there. He's been uh, in and out of the hospital a couple of times. In fact, was in the hospital yesterday. Uh, but he's out already, so praise the Lord that he's out. But be praying for him. He's got a lot of health issues going on. I didn't know about it until just a couple of days ago. He spent a month in the hospital, which is, that's a long time in the hospital these days. They don't keep you if they can help it. So uh, be praying for Alberto. Um, also, Minor is having some uh, thyroid issues, um, and uh, he's been going to the doctor. He's done well losing weight, but he doesn't want to lose any more. But uh, the thyroid can make you keep losing. So i uh, be praying for Minher as well. Anyone else? Prayer request or praise tonight? We've got a microphone ready. And I know some of you have loud, booming voices. But no matter how loud you are, the people online cannot hear you without the mic. So please wait for the mic. Who's got a prayer request or praise? Dave does. right thigh and it just got more infected until now she's looking to go to Washington Hospital Center oh. tomorrow well she's spending the night at uh, Kaiser Permanente on Capitol Hill but um, they're going either going to remove it surgically or lance it or whatever but she asked for prayer um, uh, Dad's back at home, um, but uh, it is pretty concerning. She was running 102 temperature for two days, and they got that down. And she had a CAT scan and, and everything. Today, they did that to find out how deep the infection was. But uh, if I could just pray for her and lift her up. Yes, pray for her, Alberto, and Minor as well. Please. Lord, I pray for Alberto and Minor. And we've seen him losing weight over the past month. And Lord, uh, he looks good, but he doesn't want to lose any more weight. And uh, we just uh, pray that uh, the doctors... Uh, the medication that they're giving him will um, uh, maintain his weight, Lord. I pray for uh, my mother. She's in, uh, well, for all intents and purposes, uh, spending the night in the hospital. And uh, it's concerning uh, when you have an infection like this, when you're up in age. Lord, uh, thank you for... Uh, medical staff uh, that uh, are doing their thing. Lord, um, we trust everything will turn out okay. We thank you that our fever is down, Lord. So thank you for making the body uh, wonderfully. And uh, Lord, thank you for ordering our footsteps. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Blood drive is Friday. You do have to sign up for a time. Uh, we wanted the blood mobile to come out, but they don't, they don't do the blood mobile anymore. Um, but this is uh, a community outreach. We want, to, we want to help people. We want to reach people. Please be praying. Even if you can't come, can't donate, or not willing to donate uh, for whatever reason, uh, pray for those workers that come out. We want to witness to them and share Christ with them and, and show them the love of Christ as well. So it'll be in the fellowship hall if you can 
come out and donate blood, or you want to come in volunteer to help. We need some uh, people to help come in at 1130 uh, Friday morning. So uh, please be praying for that. Uh, anyone else? Prayer request or praise? Yes, Dana. Wait, 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 wait. He's coming. No. Uh, please pray for Grayson. He has an inner ear infection and swimmer's ear, and he was dizzy, and it did make him throw up. He did go to the doctor again today, and they gave him some medicine, and it was crazy expensive. I don't know what's going on with some of these medications just for steroid eardrops. It was like over $200. I was like, and that's what insurance says. Crazy stuff is going on, as we know. <laughs> so pray for him. Um, that he'll feel more comfortable that this uh, medication will work quickly. We do have a praise, uh, Kenny's mom. Uh, the one test, I don't know if you had told him, for your mom had come back okay, but her, his brother was able to pick her up because she's down in Florida all by herself. So he was able to pick her up and take her to his house while we're waiting to see, um, I know she's gonna have a consultation for her operation. So she's with family members, she's not by herself, which we, we did not want, and she is, oh, she's up here. I just learned this. Uh, he must talk to his sister. <laughs> so she's up here with his sister. So it, that's good news, because I was, I was, you know, none of us wanted, you know, we wanted her up here, and we were like, she's got to come. So, so comfortably, she was able to fly. They must have got her on a plane and got her up here from South Carolina, but she lives in Florida. So that's good news. But to continue to pray, because she's 87. And for her to go through this operation that looks like it has to be done will, will be uh, major for her. And recovery is, is a few weeks. Okay. So. That's good that she's here. Kenny, would you lift her up? Your mom, Grayson, and also would you pray for Ian Romain? We've been praying for him, that, that little boy. It's very, very serious. It's brain tumor. They've... The doctors have done everything they can. It's in, he's in God's hands. So pray for them. Lord, we thank you for this time. We can uh, come to you in prayer. Lord, uh, we pray for Ian, that you would just intervene and heal his, his body, take the tumor away out of his brain. And I pray that you would just comfort him as he's uh, going through this time right now and uh, be with the doctors, give him wisdom. Pray for my mom and her upcoming surgery that, that uh, you would give her the exact right uh, surgeon to do the procedure. And Lord, pray that you would just uh, be with her, help her to realize that you have everything under control and uh, thank you for my sister being able to take care of her and my niece uh, also. And we, and we also uh, pray for the blood drive that you would just uh, help folks to um, hear the gospel as they're giving blood or as they're working to take blood. And I pray for grace and Lord that you would heal his his uh, ear, his inner ear, uh, that you would just uh, help the antibiotic Lord to work quickly, and uh, help him to get back Lord to normal soon, so he can um, go swimming and doing all the things he does. And thank you for your goodness to us in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Prayer request or praise? Yes. I'm going to give a couple of praises and prayer requests, but um, first off, praise if uh, for those who volunteered for VBS. I know my wife did, but uh, if you're wondering if there's been any fruit besides what you've seen already, our daughter just about every day asks for, she says it like Zoomery or the way she says it. It's, it's, we understand what she's saying, but she's asking for that. And so we found the videos on YouTube and we play them and we find her dancing to them. And even on our camera, when we put her down for naps, I've seen her in her room. Sometimes she won't sleep and she'll turn the light on, but I'll see her in there practicing the little moves. So there is fruit, and she's singing the songs as best she can for a three-and-a-half-year-old. So your labor is not in vain, as they say. I mean, they're, they're, these seeds are being implanted, and almost every day I think we hear a request for that. 
And then also I've been giving out a number of tracks, different languages, English, Spanish, finding people to church here, um, some unique languages like Bengali, Nepali, um, just different languages. I find out what people speak. I met a lady today, I didn't have any, but she spoke Amharic. She's from, it's a part of Africa. I met her in Alexandria today working at um, Walgreens. So I'll, I'll try to get one of those and maybe see her again sometime. It's close to my wife's um, doctor, so um, pray for that. And then we went Sunday, because our in-laws were in, to the Spanish service, and uh, just pray for Pastor Maynard and them, because that's a great ministry, and a very rare gem you see within a church, a Spanish ministry like this, and solid preaching of like faith, and a really good admonition for them to be witnessing and being faithful to church, and if, they, if they're members serving wherever, they can, wherever God wants them to serve, and so... Please remember them as well, and he and I remember him specifically saying that he felt the love from you, Pastor Schneider, and the other pastors. He said they really love us here, and so I was encouraged by to hear that too. So, please be in prayer for all that, and just rejoice at what God is doing in this local assembly here. Amen. That's good. Uh, Troy, would you give us an update on your brother? I understand there's some good news. We've been praying for him for a while. And I'll tack one other one on to that, too. Um, I texted Beth yesterday to see how she was doing. They were in Miami for follow-up appointments. She has not responded back on if they, if there was, what all happened. And then on my brother Rod, this is huge praise. Both lungs are completely clear of cancer. Amen. And the liver, only when they did the scan a few months ago, there were 15 cancer lesions on the liver. It's down to five. Praise the Lord. That's great. We've been praying for him for a while, and it looked really, really bad. Um, I, he does know the Lord, but he even felt like, you know, I don't have long, this family get together, this is going to be the last time, and, and now both lungs are, or what was it, both lungs are cancer free in the liver, uh, two thirds reduction in spots, so praise the Lord, that's wonderful. Uh, keep praying for him. Deborah Smith is doing well, we've been praying for her, she just had her last chemo treatment a week ago, and the, uh, her cancer numbers in her blood are down into the normal range so it was like 1200 13 or 1200 12000 something like that it's supposed to be under 30 and it's down to 7 so it's wonderful god praise the lord god does answer prayer so we praise the lord for those um continue to pray for gail ailing this is uh, teresa conrad's sister has cancer. Um, I don't know a, a current status, but she's been going through treatments for cancer as well. Anyone else? Prayer request or praise? All right, I'm going to pray for these then, and uh, then we'll turn it over to Brother Mike. Father, we thank you. God, what a great report on uh, Rod Rose. God, uh, it's amazing. There seemed to be no hope, but God, with you, there's always hope. And we praise you and thank you for what you've done in this life. We thank you for what you're doing with Deborah Smith, and we're seeing her healed, and we just trust you for complete and total healing for her and for continued healing for Rod. We want to see that cancer gone, no spots left. We pray for Gail Ailing for the same thing, God, deliver her from cancer. Uh, thank you. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and you are the God who hears prayer. Thank you for that, Father. God, use us to, to get your gospel out, to share Christ with people, to share your love with people. People need you. This world is a mess. People need you. Help us, God, to point people to Christ. Bless uh, Brother Morgan now as he comes to open the word. Teach us tonight, God, and draw us closer to you. We love you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Good evening, church. Good evening. We talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, did anybody try the Old Bay on vanilla ice cream yet? Did anybody try that? I tried it. 
and it is delicious, actually. It tastes like you're uh, eating uh, eggnog, basically. So if you think about it and you have some Old Bay in your cupboard and your spice cabinet, get some vanilla ice cream and enjoy. But I don't want to think about food right now. So we're going to think about God's word. So, but sometimes you guys, some of you all look a little uptight and a little anxious. So put a smile on your face because God is good and uh, he is just so wonderful. And we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 tonight. So let's go there. And we have a lot of notes to cover. We perhaps, depending on time, may turn this into two messages. But right now it's all condensed into one. And we're on Momentum Week 4. And how are we supposed to go about our journey as Christians through this life? What are the expectations of us as believers? Um, We'll look at next week to share our faith. I actually have two copies, Dave, but thank you. Yes, I always print off two copies of my messages just in case something happens to the copy. I email it to myself as well. Uh, But I've tried to preach off a screen before, and it's just very challenging to do. So old-fashioned paper. Um, So how are we supposed to act as Christians? The expectations, what does Paul tell Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 3? As he is pastoring a church, he and Titus are kind of pastoring around the same time period, and uh, Paul really writes to them and helps them get some things in order as the New Testament church is growing and, and expanding. And how does it apply to our lives today in the matter of continuing in our faith? And I mentioned last week about the doctrines of our faith as well, and we'll dive into that, but we'll also look at characteristics about what causes us as believers to sway one way or the other in the doctrines that we believe in. You should have personal beliefs, personal convictions, and then there's um, overall doctrine uh, in scriptures, doctrine that we adhere to as a body of believers, specifically our local church, and those are actually posted on our church website. I'd encourage you guys to look at that and kind of understand what is our church's position on certain topics such as salvation, uh, the humanity of Jesus Christ, the deity of Jesus Christ, um, the Holy Scriptures and how that relates to us for, through preservation. It's uh, infallible, the infallible Word of God. So just some very interesting things. But tonight we'll look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 12 through 15 as our key text, and then we'll back up to the beginning of the chapter and study God's uh, Word together. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll begin reading in verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for using Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to pen these valuable scriptures for us many, many, many years later. We pray, God, that as we study these verses, that you would draw out application for us to apply to our lives in 2022. It's just crazy to believe how the years go by. But as the years go by, your word remains the same and your word endures forever, and we just praise you for that. We ask that you would teach us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So continuation. Well, Paul, first off, talks about this in verses 1 through 9. He talks about perilous times. Does that sound familiar? Let's go back to verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. What are the last days? Well, we're living in them right now. Days doesn't necessarily um, portray a specific time period. We've talked about this, and Pastor has in in recent weeks, certainly, of those predicting the the return of the Lord, the exact day and the hour. I think the last one was 88 reasons why, why Jesus was coming back in 1988 or something like that, and we've had certain groups, um, you know, on the radio, I think there used to be a radio station, 107.9, I think was the radio station. There was a a very popular preacher uh, who, you know, predicted the coming of Christ, I think, several times, and of course it didn't happen. But the last days, Paul says that perilous times will come. 
The last days, many people think, is basically when Jesus Christ came, he died on the cross, he rose again, the New Testament church is being established. We're essentially in the last, the last days. But let's look at some verses here. Acts 2.17 tells us this. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams. So in the book of Acts, they realized a little bit it was kind of a transitory time period as the, as the church was becoming established there. Uh, Hebrews 1, 2 says, Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, Jesus, whom he hath the appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. 2 Peter 3, 3, describing the last days. Knowing this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Certainly we see that today. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times... Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's even within the church. Uh, so we have, to be, we have to realize what the last days are about. Spurgeon said, apart from the second advent of our Lord, the world is more likely to sink into a pandemonium than to rise into a millennium. Now that's kind of a scorched earth look at it. Um, but certainly he is, he is right. And Spurgeon realized that in the mid-1800s he was talking about that and describing uh, the last days. So it's very interesting. But let's look at humanity's character during the last days. And we, I know oftentimes I will read this scripture and we think, we look at these characteristics that we're going to dive into pretty, pretty deeply here. And we, we almost read them in abstract, like it, Paul was only writing to the church that Timothy was pastoring. Yes, he was, but the scripture is still for us today, right? So we have to be careful of these characteristics because this is what causes our doctrine to diminish. This is what causes Christians or so-called Christians to fall away, if you will, or to not have that genuine relationship that Jesus Christ desires uh, with his children. So let's look at humanity's character. What does he say? He says this, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Wow. Do we see self-love today? Man, our shampoo even encourages us to love ourselves, right? Oh my goodness. Love yourself. Biggie size it. We just discovered the $5 Biggie box at Wendy's the other day. I mean, they've had them for a while, or, you know, Taco Bell has the $5 box, and it's just incredibly healthy for you. But now they have a strawberry Frosty, and it's all about making yourself feel good, right? With whatever we have. And we love ourselves. We love to pamper ourselves. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but when we have this self-love, when we love ourselves more than we love God, there's a problem. Romans 12.3 says this, For I say... Through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, seriously, according as God has, hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. You know, because of the self-love, the following characteristics that we're going to look at here in the, fo in the following verses really flow out of this self-love. Why is what Paul is getting ready to list out for Timothy here and for us as believers couple thousand years later, why is, why does, do all these negative characteristics flow out of self-love? Well, man essentially makes his, himself his own God. And that's what we see today. And when we, when we make ourselves our own God, uh, we become covetous. And this is going to be the next characteristic that we look at. Covetous means fond of silver, specifically money uh, in this passage here. We know that money, the love of money, is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. The love of money causes us to err from the faith. That's very interesting. And pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Money is a tool. We can give it, we can spend it, we can save it. But when we become covetous, fond of silver, desiring it above the things of God, it causes us to diminish in our faith. So we love ourselves, we're covetous, we're also boasters. I'm talking to myself as well. 
an empty pretender, someone who just talks about their great accomplishments. Have you ever met a one-upper? You're in conversation, and everything you say, they have something better. It's kind of hard to ha hold a conversation with someone like that, isn't it? Have you ever found yourself being a one-upper? Somebody tells you a story, oh yeah, but this one time I did this, and it just sensationalizes and sensationalizes. You know, us hunters and uh, fishermen, you know, we always kind of like to one-up the next guy as we talk and we share stories of deer and fish and things like that. But we must not be uh, boasters. Paul talks about this in Romans. He says, backbiters in verse 30, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. What Paul lists here for Timothy, Paul lists many of these in the book of Romans, specifically uh, chapter 1. So in perilous times, in the last days, these times will come. The characteristics of People who make themselves, who love themselves, they are covetous, they are fond of silver, they're boasters, they're proud. Pride. Pride is terrible. I know pastor often talks about that. Pride is kind of like that silent killer in your life that you may not even be aware of, but everybody else around you is aware of it. That's very interesting. I've, I have found myself uh, in that position, and I think it's very important when the Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. Where there is no pride, there is no contention. So if you're having an argument, an argument, I'm not talking about a, a healthy discussion, an argument, there is pride involved. Every time. Only by pride cometh contention. And in the last days, we see pride. Showing oneself above others. Uh, overtopping someone else. James 4, 6 says this, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. It's like we're acting prideful and we think you know, I'm doing great things for God and if you can picture God, I don't know if this actually doesn't occur, but I like to think in kind of word pictures or pictured in my mind. God resists the proud. Can you imagine God resisting you, just holding up against you. You ever think, um, you know, if you've had children and uh, you try to open the door when your child's behind it because your child doesn't want to be in trouble for one reason or another. Have you ever had that experience when your child is holding the door and you as the parent are trying to bust through the door? You know, not necessarily SWAT team. You're not going to kick the door down. But, you know, feel that resistance of that door as that child is on the other side and you're trying to get to your child for one reason or another to speak with them or to um, educate them in the things of the Lord. Okay, think about that pressure that you're feeling. That's what your pride does. God is, God, God is resisting you when you are prideful. In the last days, it's not just for the church here. It's for the church present today. So he says they're covetous, they're fond of silver, they're boasters, they're pretenders, they're proud. God resists them. They're blasphemers. Speaking evil, slanderous, reproachful, abusive language against God. Wow. They took that very seriously in the New Testament times. Even today, there is great reverence in the Jewish culture for uh, the name of God. If you visit the Wailing Wall or you visit some of these certain holy sites, they, are, they, they take it very, very seriously. Even when they were penning the scriptures, you know, they would, they would wash, they would use a new writing utensil. They took the name of God very seriously. And, and today, and I'll just speak of the American church, we just tend to use God's name in a very uh, haphazard manner, I feel. You know, He is our Lord. Yes, He is our Lord, but that doesn't mean we just use his name uh, inappropriately when we, you know, stub our toe or when we don't like things or somebody cuts out in front of us and we just use God's name uh, in vain. Paul realized that he was a blasphemer himself. First Timothy 1.13. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, injurious, excuse me, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul was doing it in unbelief. How much more serious for the believer that knows of the things of God and does it anyways. Uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 2, he's talking to the hypocrites specifically, and he tells them that the name of God is blasphemed among them because of you. He's talking to the Pharisees there. They were telling 
people not to steal. They were stealing. They were telling people to do this. They were doing the, or don't do this. Then the Pharisees would do exactly what they were telling those uh, in, under their instruction not to do. So we have to be very careful about that. Disobedient to parents. Oh man, we've never experienced that before, have we? We've never been disobedient to our parents, have we? Yes, we have. Some years ago, there was even a, a judge in Orlando that ruled that an 11-year-old boy had the right to seek a divorce from his parents. This is our society. This is the last days. So that he could be adopted by a foster family. You know, there's few legal divorces from children to parent. Uh, but it's, it's, it is far more common that children simply disregard or disobey uh, their parents. How often do we disobey our Father, our Heavenly Father? We think, I would never divorce my parents. That's crazy. But in a, in a way, we do it to God fairly often. So we must be careful of that. Titus 1.16, Paul writes to that young pastor. He says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. He also says there in Titus 3.3, 3, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lust, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. Why do you think Paul had to write in Ephesians to, for children to obey their parents? There must have been some sort of disobedience within the children of the church. Perhaps he was looking on. So how much more so in the church, or just the same, rather, in the church today? in the last days that we will see disobedient to parents. Now, there is going to be hope. Don't worry. I know it's a little bit of doom and gloom here as we look at all these negative characteristics, but stay with me. Don't check out. Don't go totally check out and say, oh, this is so negative. I can't listen to it. We're going to have some positive things to come towards in, in the end of the chapter because it's interesting how Paul often will kind of like, you know, as a boxer, kind of put you up against the ropes, right? And then all of a sudden hit you with like a Mike Tyson uppercut from like the basement. But then he kind of brings us back and encourages us. So that's what we're going to look at uh, here in a little bit. So let's hang in there. Unthankful, thankless. Uh, Luke 6, 35, but love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. You know what? We shouldn't worry about thankless people. The Bible tells us that there are going to be thankless people. And what are we supposed to do? Lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. So if Jesus, God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil, we also need to be kind to the unthankful and to the evil. We shouldn't say, oh, man, that's just my pet peeve. This person is so unthankful. Well, are you really getting a blessing out of that when, you're, when you have an attitude of unthankfulness to that person? We should be thankful that God has given us the opportunity uh, to give. So they're unthankful. They are unholy. They are wicked. Unholy. God is holy, right? He tells us, be holy for I am holy there in Leviticus and also First Peter. Unholy is essentially the opposite of God. It's the opposite of God's character. What does he tell Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9? Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. Wickedness, unholy things. Without natural affection, do these sound very familiar to Romans chapter 1 to you? Hard-hearted towards kindred. This, this, without natural affection, speaks specifically about familial relationships. Yes, you may have father, mother, children, but this without natural affection, there is a deep disconnect in the family as far as love and reciprocating love between or among uh, the family unit. Hard-hearted towards kindred without familial love and the sense of obligation. And where does the obligation fall on? It falls on fathers, ultimately, and mothers and supporting. But isn't it terrible to see a child that's neglected by their father? It should make us upset. It should 
well up inside of us some, some righteous anger to do something about it. If God impresses on your heart to take care of someone because there is a need, then we need to obey. Because in the last days, there is going to be a lot of uh, affection that is not there. There's going to be many without natural affection. Romans 131 tells us again, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. We have to be careful, church, that we don't fall into these categories. We say, I've never had a hard-hearted heart towards kindred. If we're all being honest with ourselves, haven't you had that moment where you're like, if this child doesn't obey, or we've had moments as parents, I know I have, where you're, you have that hard-heartedness towards your child, that anger, and you almost question God sometimes as to why am I in this situation? How selfish. Children are a gift from God. And he's given them to us to bring them up in the nurture and admiration of, uh, admonition of the Lord. So not only is their uh, natural affection doesn't exist much in the last days, there's also truce breakers. This just means, you know, kind of a traitor breaking a, a covenant. Luke 6.16 speaks of Judas. It calls him a traitor. You know, you think of uh, what's another famous traitor in history? Benedict Arnold, you know, that's kind of synonymous with the word uh, traitor. If you call someone a Benedict Arnold, they kind of, you kind of know what they're, what they're talking about. There's going to be truce breakers. Say one thing and do the opposite or do nothing. It's always interesting around this time, it doesn't matter what political party you find yourself in, there's a lot of promises being made. Not necessarily a lot, a lot of promises being fulfilled. So, truce breakers. False accusers. This one is very interest, interesting here. And in the Greek, the word is diabolos or diabolos. What do you hear there? Diabolical? Evil? Uh, it means false accuser, devil, slanderer. Paul says there's going to be false accusers. The, Satan didn't want the church. Jesus Christ had accomplished what he came to accomplish. The church was becoming established. The devil was using folks during this time period to slander God's name, to try and discredit God's work. And he tells uh, for Timothy this in 1 Timothy 3, 6, not a novice, less, and uh, about qualifications here of a, a pastor, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Or there, that word is false accuser. Paul was giving Timothy a heads up. Um, certainly in, in ministry and certainly in your life, if you've been falsely accused, you certainly have felt that before. And we have to be careful um, not to falsely accuse. The Bible calls uh, Satan the accuser of the brethren. We must be careful in the last days. So they are uh, false accusers. They are slanderers. He also says this here in verse 3, incontinent, meaning without incontinent. Yes, incontinent. Sorry, I'm trying to say that word correctly. Without self-control. Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Perhaps you don't struggle with self-control, but have you ever been in your shed and something falls off the shelf or you hit something in your shed and you just want to send something through the window of your shed? Anybody ever done that? Or you stub your toe in the middle of the night and you're just looking for a nice empty piece of drywall to put a hole in? I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but you got to exercise. We have to exercise self-control. We have to have rule over our spirit. And this is in all aspects of life. You guys know how much I love fast food and how many apps I have on my phone. I mean, the Wendy's experience, the Wendy's app is pretty good. McDonald's is pretty good. Taco Bell's app is terrible. Okay? But it's just so easy just to, you know, oh my goodness, I have uh, 6,000 points to Chick-fil-A. Because we eat a lot of Chick-fil-A at work, so if I order through the app... Um, uh, you know, I get points. And man, all these points. And you can really lose self-control uh, eating fast food. What, whatever it may be in your life. Finances, uh, eating, uh, discipline, exercise. 
whatever it may be. I've noticed, and you know, I'm not, the, I'm not super old, but I've noticed, you know, the McChickens hang out with you a little longer than they did when you were 18 years old, right? That metabolism is not the same, okay? Instead of having to run just a mile, you may have to double it. You may have to run two miles. And I've done that before. I, I'm going to eat this Whopper, but uh, no worries. I'm training for this or that, so I'm going to be able to, like, negate it. And that's probably the worst. That's the worst for your health, by just eating and then negating it, negating it with exercise. That's not the most... Uh, the, the most healthy way to go about it. But whatever, your, whatever self-control, and I think that's a big thing in society today, where we've made it easy. And I'll, I'll just speak to finances here for a minute, because uh, I kind of geek out a little bit on finances and, and biblical stewardship. But we, it's so easy now in our society where we don't even have to have our wallet with us today, right? We can just tap our phone. We can just tap our watch to pay. Uh, we can, I, I think there's all kinds of different ways, wireless pay, or when you swipe that credit card or debit card, you don't feel the pain as when you see uh, Benjamin Franklin leave your hands when you have to pay to somebody. So kids today don't even really, Grayson had never seen a $100 bill, I think, until like uh, a few weeks back or a few months back. He said, is that a $100 bill? I said, yeah, it is. But our society today has made it so easy to just make that quick transaction. And if you're struggling uh, in your finances, there's a, there's a lack of self-control there, or whatever it may be, overeating, uh, indulging in too much fast food. And I say it kind of in a joking manner, but if we can't be disciplined in the simple things in life, how are we going to be disciplined in our spiritual lives? I'm speaking to myself as well. If it's easy for me to go, you know, get on an app and order a, uh, you know, a strawberry frosty, but it should be even easier to get up and read my Bible consistently and, and do what God wants us to do. So uh, just bringing you a little uh, close to home sometimes of the things that I, I battle. So without self-control, they're also fierce. Fierce means not tame or savage. What do you think about when you hear not tame or savage? Think of an animal, or I do at least. Think of a wild animal. This word here is described for us in Matthew 8, 28. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. These two individuals were demon-possessed. They were not able to be tamed. Of course, they met Jesus, and Jesus uh, solves everything, of course. But think about that. In the last days, there are going to be those, certainly demon possession, uh, untamed, uh, savage. So they're, they're fierce. There's despisers of those that are good. This word here means they are hostile to virtue. They are against virtuous things. This phrase here, despisers of those that are good, or this concept here, is only found uh, in 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. It's pretty interesting. Was there a specific example that Paul was thinking about? The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, I kind of like to imagine, but you know, we have to be careful about adding to the scriptures. But why did Paul uh, include this example of despisers of those that are good? We should not be hostile to virtuous things. When something good happens, especially for the work of the Lord, we should be praising God for it. Not saying, uh, you know, we have missionaries come in. Oh, what do you mean they only had three saved? They should add four. Well, there it is. Despisers of those that are good. We shouldn't be hostile to that. Uh, traitors, that means a surrenderer. Uh, we already talked about that. Heady, that means someone who's rash or reckless. It's kind of a bull in the china shop mentality. Proverbs 10.14 says, Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. You ever spoken too soon? You ever put your foot in your mouth, as the phrase goes? Yeah, that's what Paul is talking about. Rash and reckless with our, with our actions, with our words, whatever it may be. High-minded. This word means to be clouded. Those in the last days who love themselves, as Paul talked about there in verse 2, their head is in the clouds. What happens when your head is in the clouds? Or if you've ever flown and you're above the clouds? 
What happens? Can you see anything below you? No. no. What happens when you get underneath the clouds? Exactly. But you can see below you. You can see what's going on. And Paul is t- telling us here, these high-minded people are blinded with pride and conceit. That word means to render, this is very interesting, here, you know, as you, as you study these words in, the, in their languages, to render foolish or stupid. Man, Paul is using some very direct language here, isn't he? Foolish and stupid, be clouded. We got to get our heads out of the clouds. We can't be blinded with pride and conceit. 1 Timothy 6.14 He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Doting about. Just being high-minded, consumed with themselves. Meanwhile, others are looking on and the high-minded individual can't see himself. Why? Because his head is in the clouds. That is the message tonight. Get your head out of the clouds. <laughs> That's what Paul is saying. Get your head out of the clouds. So they're high-minded. And then here, they're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. James 4, 3. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. We're asking things because we love pleasure more than we love God. And what does James tell us? We ask, but we receive not. Why? Because we're asking amiss. We're trying to consume it for ourselves, our lust, our own personal desires. We should not love pleasure more than we love God. Think about what we're doing when we are loving ourselves more than we love God. We're essentially saying... Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, but you know what? Good for you, but I got it under control. (laughs) Peter outright denied Christ verbally in front of others. And we think, oh man, how could Peter do that? That is terrible. We just do it more internally. And uh, I think we as a church, locally, globally, need to stop loving ourselves so much. So, let's continue. Verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. In our self-obsessed world, people feel very free to have a salad bar religion. They pick and choose what they want. They feel free to be very spiritual, but sense no obligation to be biblical. And that, that's not my quote. That's from David uh, Guzik. I sometimes study some of his materials. Uh, but very interesting. They feel free to be very spiritual, but sense no obligation to be biblical. We see that in our church. We see that in our lives. Spiritual, great. But if, you're, if your spirituality is not an, an outflowing of your biblical stance on Scripture, then it's just all for naught. Right. It's fake. It's, it's pharisaical. It's exactly what Paul said in Romans chapter 2. The name of God is blaspheme among uh, the Gentiles because of you, because of us. May we not bring harm to the name of Christ because we have a shallow Christianity. And the last couple years have made it very easy for the American church, probably for the global church as well, to develop a shallow Christianity. I'll get up on a little bit of a soapbox here. It is super easy to click join live on Facebook or YouTube. Super easy. And we think, man, I'm on the couch. I can wear shorts, T-shirt. I, I tell you what, when we first had to shut down in March of 2020 and didn't come back until June, church on TV, it was hard to pay attention It was hard to gain spiritual application. Could you? Yes, because God's word is always applicable. But it became easy for me to get lazy very quick. You think, oh, you know, no one's going to miss me. You know, it's online. Nobody knows. You know, I'm just a a click. They can only see how many people join. They can't really see my name or or whatnot. Um, And we have become lazy 
uh, in, our, in our spiritual uh, culture. And we have to get back to that, that biblical stance on Scripture. So cool to see many here uh, tonight. We should see many more. Not because we want to puff ourselves up and just you know, give ourselves a tap on the back and become our biggest fans. No, it's so more people can hear God's uh, word and we can change uh, for the better of how God wants us uh, to what God wants us to be. So they had a form of godliness. Jesus or God one day is going to look at many and they're going to say, have we prophesied in your name? We've cast out devils. We've you know, done all these great things. And what is he going to say? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Because why? They had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. How many of you all like to vacuum? Who likes to vacuum in here? Okay. Maybe you have a dirt devil, or if you're uh, very uh, well-to-do, you have a Kirby that can basically suck up your dog if you got too close to it. You know, they're like $5,000, and you make payments on your vacuum cleaner. Good for you. That's crazy if you have a payment on your vacuum cleaner. I don't know if anybody does, so don't take offense to that. But, you know, certainly they offer payment plans for vacuum cleaners. I mean, they make payment plans for everything today. You buy it on Amazon, you can buy a T-shirt and make four payments on a T-shirt. It's, it's crazy. But have you ever tried to vacuum and not plug it in? I'm not talking about the old school, like, push-along vacuums, like, you know, in the old-time nurseries, you know, you used to vacuum up crackers with that little vacuum. Does a vacuum work if it's not plugged in? No. Why? No power. That's what Paul is talking about here. A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You're not plugged into God. You just have a form of godliness. You're the vacuum cleaner. Great. That Dyson vacuum cleaner that they've marketed to you, it looks so cool. It has 50 attachments. Does nothing if it's not plugged in and used properly. And we, church, have to be plugged in and used properly in the potter's Hands. We need to allow him to mold and to shape us into what he wants us uh, to be. Secondly, let's look at purposeful living. And I, I want to back up a little bit, excuse me. In verses 6 through 9, Paul gives us an example of the form of godliness and what happens. He says this, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. That form of godliness only leads us away into lust. It leads us into captivity, laden with sins ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Knowledge is good, but if only we use knowledge to just, again, one-up the next guy or to one-up the next uh, lady, we only have that form of godliness and we deny the power. And he gives an example. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, okay, the form of godliness, what did these, what did these individuals do? What, what did they do for the plagues of Egypt? Remember? The magicians, they were kind of going one for one on the plagues. They were, they were kind of trying to have that. That's the example of the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They weren't doing that in God's power. What were they doing that in? Satan's power. Spiritual warfare. It still exists. We don't really see it as much in America. I don't, I don't want to say maybe as we should, but why do we see it in, in countries... Uh, around the world where some of our missionaries go. Because they're bringing God's name to a spiritually dark place. But also, what does he say in verse 12? Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus, what? Shall suffer persecution. So I asked the same question I asked last week. Why is the American church not seeing persecution? Ask ourselves that. And think about it. Why are we seeing persecution like our brothers and sisters around the world? It's very interesting. I know when uh, Rebecca's parents, uh, they were in the Cayman Islands for a few years and pastoring, it was very interesting to see. You know, there's a lot of uh, Jamaican influence there and from Caribbean influence. And, and if you know anything, there's a lot of kind of voodoo and spiritual, uh, you know, not spiritual, non-spiritual things with witch doctors and whatnot. And even they w would experience some very crazy things uh, that were very unexplainable other than spiritual uh, warfare and experiencing that. And uh, I've had some friends who, you know, grew up in Africa and their parents would bring the gospel to Africa and they would experience some very um, 
crazy things and some very difficult things. And here, what Paul is uh, reminding us of Janus and Jambres, withstood Moses. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning their faith. So there we see the example of what a form of godliness uh, does and can do. So, a lot of negativity there that Paul talks about. Characteristics of those who love themselves. I'm not going to look at all the words there, but just a few covetous, without natural affection, high-minded. But how, are, how do we get past those things? Or how is Timothy going to get past those things as he's pastoring uh, his church? Secondly, let's look at purposeful living. And most likely, I'm not going to finish all seven pages of my notes tonight, so we'll continue next week. So we're probably going to close down with this uh, second point here. I, I, I sent my message along earlier, and, and uh, someone from our media team said, are you going to finish all seven pages, or are we going to uh, stop? Because uh, there's a lot of Scripture in this tonight. Um, and so it just, it's really cool how Scripture kind of gives, its, gives us clarification. I can, I can come up with a fancy outline and you can listen or fall asleep, whatever you choose to do. Uh, but Scripture is ultimately the best commentator on Scripture. You know, it's often said the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. So purposeful living. How are we supposed to live in the last days? How is Timothy supposed to live in the last days? Well, wait a minute. Timothy was in the last days? Yes. And we're still in the last days? Absolutely. So, it's still appl- it was applicable then, and it's also applicable now. Verse 10, he says this to Timothy. But thou, you, Timothy, hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord, out of all of them, the Lord delivered me. So he says, Timothy, you have fully known my doctrine, my teaching, my very belief of God. Paul was reiterating to Timothy what he had learned Our beliefs determine our actions and way of life. I believe that uh, Wendy's has a good Frosty. So whenever I want to go to Wendy's, or whenever I want a Frosty, where do I go? Go to Wendy's. Uh, You may believe that uh, investing in Bitcoin is going to make you a giant millionaire. So what do you do? You invest in Bitcoin. Our beliefs determine our actions. I'm not slamming you if you invest in Bitcoin. It's just you know, for your illustrative purposes. You may believe that uh, Ford is the greatest brand ever built. Amen. And you buy a Ford. <laughs> Coming from someone who drives a Toyota. That's interesting. <laughs> but you have had Fords. <laughs> Toyotas last way longer. Uh, whatever our beliefs determine our actions and our way of life. You know, you may believe your particular football team is better than the other. You know, I I got in a fist fight in high school over who was better. The Redskins, Commanders, as they're now known, or the Raiders. Can you believe that? How ridiculous. Our beliefs determine our actions. I got suspended from a soccer game because I got in a fist fight over whose football team is better. Arguing. Push, and then I was fist to cuss from there. And ironically, one of my friends who's a police officer now broke it up. So even before we had even graduated high school, he was breaking up fights and uh, laying down the law. But our beliefs do determine our actions. You know, it's apparent that Timothy was around Paul enough to learn, learn his ways and his uh, methods. Proverbs 4, 2 tells us this. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. Where do we get our doctrine from? God's Word. We don't get our doctrine from commentators. We don't get our doctrine from Google. 
we don't even get our doctrine primarily from our pastor. Where does our pastor get his doctrine from? God's Word. If what we preach and teach doesn't line up with God's Word, then we are doing a disservice to God. A very, it's a very dangerous disservice to God. So we have to be solid in our doctrine. Now, the doctrine of what color the pew should be, that's not a doctrine. That's a preference. Uh, the doctrine of, you know, uh, who gets to park where in the church parking lot. That's not a doctrine. That's a preference. So the doctrine, the teachings of Scripture. And I would encourage you, uh, right there on our church website, I think it's a drop down. It says what we believe, and you'd be able to look at the church constitution, kind of what we believe there. And it's, it's very important for you to understand, but not only to read it to believe what the church believes, you have to believe it for yourself. You can get to that belief by others guiding you there, but you have to uh, adopt that doctrine for yourself. You can't just have that form of godliness that Paul uh, talks about. So Timothy observed Paul's manner of life, his purpose, his faith, his long suffering, his charity, his patience. But then Paul talks about in verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. So Paul recalls specific times where he was persecuted and afflicted. Why was he persecuted and afflicted? Because he was living godly in Christ Jesus. And as we study the book of Acts on Sunday mornings, I know we'll get to these. Um, and he talks about Antioch. Acts, this comes from Acts 13. Paul, Paul recalls it here, or Luke does. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. They kicked them out of the city. Iconium, what happened to Paul there? Acts 14, verse 5. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them. Man, what a way to go. That is a very barbaric way of execution. Stoning. Think of Achan and his sin there in the book of Joshua. They stoned his entire family. Um, terrible, terrible, terrible. Paul didn't even do anything wrong. Achan did. He sinned against God. He sinned against the whole uh, nation of Israel there. Paul was stoned for his faith. Then Lystra, Acts 14, 19. And there came there certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. They thought they killed Paul. And Paul was miraculously raised back to life and you know, continued his, uh, his ministry. So he was recalling that to Timothy. No doubt for illustration. But what does he say? But out of all of them in there in verse 11, the Lord delivered me. God's promise of deliverance is fulfilled. He always takes care of his children. Paul's ministry continued even after these uh, events. I think of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. We often pray for God's deliverance in a physical manner, Right? I'm in this situation, God, help, help me get out of it. And it's kind of, we want our, our physical bodies to be removed from, you know, we go through this hard situation, God, please get me out of this situation. And it's more of, we think about it, at least I do in my mind, in a physical nature. But what happened to Stephen? I'd say he was delivered. Look at this experience. Acts seven fifty five through 56. But he... Being full of the Holy Ghost, Stephen was connected to God at the highest level. He was being stoned, actively stoned for his faith. Looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Wow. And Jesus, standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. And Stephen, the Bible tells us, you know, he gave up, gave up the ghost, yielded up the ghost. God delivered him, but in a different way. God brought him to heaven. God allowed Stephen to see the glory of God. Wow. Wow. Moses, he had to cover his face for a little bit, right? His face was glowing after he came down from the mountain. 
just a very powerful story of Stephen. So Paul was delivered, Stephen was delivered, and then again, I know we've talked about this verse over and over, but then again in verse 12, yea, and all that li will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Godly living produces persecution. Paul realized this in Galatians 5. He says this, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? So what is he saying here? Paul is using the physical manifestation of circumcision or uncircumcision. And what he's saying here, if I'm preaching exactly what the Jews want me to preach, why do I yet suffer persecution? He's saying, well, if I'm preaching exactly what they want me to preach, why am I suffering persecution? Well, you're suffering persecution because he was preaching exactly the opposite of the popular belief of that day. He says, if I'm su why do I yet suffer per persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The cross is offensive. When we bring the message of Christ and we say there is an eternal separation from God, if you don't accept Christ, that is going to be offensive to some people. That doesn't mean necessarily that we have to deliver it in an offensive manner. You know, we're not going to scream at somebody and say this or that, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not, most often, that's not going to point people to Jesus. That's just going to turn them away. What Paul is saying here, if I'm, if I'm preaching exactly what they want me to preach, then the cross is of no importance. What Jesus has done is of no importance. Galatians 6.12, And as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh... There's that physical manifestation of spirituality that the Jews believe, circumcision. They constrain you, they compel you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. When we preach opposite of the world's belief, we will suffer persecution. And we'll close here uh, in the next five minutes with verses 13 and 14. He says this, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. During these last days and perilous times, evil imposters will increase. That word seducers there means uh, an, impost an imposter, a fake, someone who is not who they say they are. We have to be careful that we are not that seducer, that that cannot be uh, described of us. Proverbs 24, 1 says, Be not thou in envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. A lot of times we see those in society, and we may see someone having a measure of success, and we can really become jealous or envious of evil things. Not necessarily the act of evil things, but you may see a recording artist, or you may see someone who's basically a God denier, and why do they have millions of dollars and I don't? Why are they, quote unquote, blessed and I'm not? Well, what does Proverbs say? It says, be not envious against evil men and don't desire to be with them. Proverbs 28, 5, evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. When we seek God, we will understand exactly why God has us where we are. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and what lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. He doesn't say, and he'll give you the GPS coordinates, and he will just uh, say, good luck. No, he directs our path when we acknowledge him. Imposters are hearers of the word. They deceive themselves. James 1.22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. There's no deception like self-deception. You know, we can think, man, I got it all together. But we are deceiving ourselves. I know I've thought about that in my life. Ah, man, I got it all together. I'm good to go. No, I'm just deceiving myself. I'm disconnected from God. I'm trying to find pleasure in the things of the world, and I'm deceiving myself. A young couple moved into a neighborhood, and the next morning while they were eating breakfast, the young woman saw her neighbor hanging her wa wash to dry. That laundry is not very clean, she said. She doesn't know how to wash correctly. Perhaps she needs better laundry soap. 
Her husband looked out on but remained silent. Every time her neighbor hung her wash to dry, the young woman repeated her observations about the dirty laundry. About one month later, the woman was surprised to see a nice, clean wash on the line and said to her husband, Look, she has learned how to wash correctly. I wonder who taught her this. The husband said, I got up early this morning and cleaned our windows. <laughs> Oftentimes we can look through the lens, a dirty lens, and the thing that needs cleaning is ourselves. When you start to often comment on someone else, oh man, I don't know why they do this. Why do they have all these problems? I guarantee to you often, and I found myself doing this recently, there's a spiritual connection between you and God, between me and God. When I start looking, if I say, but Troy, I don't know why Troy does this or that. Oftentimes, that's our, we're deceiving ourselves there, and we're being a fruit inspector on someone else, someone else, and we have something lacking in our own lives. So I encourage you, before you start going this way and that way, uh, look at look, uh, what Matthew 7, 3, 3 through 5 says. Why behold the mote in the, thy brother's eye? But consider it's not the beam that is in thine own eye. You know, we, our brother has a toothpick in his eye. And, you know, we have a giant oak tree sticking out of our eye. And we're worried about our brother's toothpick. I'm worried about Troy's toothpick, that he needs to change. And I'm not, I'm not looking at myself. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out, out of thine eye. Hey, Troy, let me get that for you. I've noticed that in your life. Let me go ahead and help you with that. And behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. We, church, tonight need to clean our windows. Yes. We need to clean uh, what we're looking through. And how do we do that? How do we clean our windows? With God's word. In closing tonight, he tells Timothy this, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That word continue there is a verb, and a verb indicates action. We, to, we are to abide. We are to dwell. We are to endure. How can, you, how can dwelling be an action? Well, picture it like this. You know, we're in Christ. We are a new creature. But we as Christians, we shouldn't plan on this. But if you, you get away from God, what do you have to do? You have to go back. You have to dwell. Uh, you get away here. You have to go back. You have to abide. We are to continue. We are to remain. We are to be present. John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed, abiding in God's word. I had made a, a practice of reading through the Bible in a year, and I, th I think that's extremely beneficial. But what I had found myself doing in my life is you version app, and I got more excitement out of like clicking the complete button than I did actually reading uh, the scriptures. So we have to be careful. We have to not only be continuing in our iPhone just to get to that goal. We have to be continuing in the Word, abiding in the Word, not the physical screen of you know, the confetti that you've completed a day. It's the enjoyment and the benefits of actually abiding in God's Word, not in the action of just simply checking off a box. And when we do that, God calls us His disciples. Not only his disciples, but his disciples indeed. You are my disciples. The confirmation there. John 15, 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Abide in my love. 1 John 2, 24. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. 2 John 1, 6. And this is love, that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. We must continue in the things we have learned and never put them aside. 
He says, you have been assured of this. It has been made faithful in your life. It has been rendered trustworthy in your life, the things that ye, you have learned. And we're going to look at next week how Timothy put these into action and some of the influences in, in his life, such as his family members that really brought him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And then we're going to look at specifically the topic of multiplication, making disciples. What does God command us to do? It's good to have momentum. We have to have momentum, first off, personally in our own lives. But what does God call us to do in the spreading of his kingdom and the things of the Lord? So I thank you for being here uh, this evening and uh, just really am thankful for the opportunity and it's crazy to think that uh, we are going on 10 years here and uh, just pretty incredible our, our kids have grown up here and just thankful for the opportunity to connect with uh, many of you and just praise God for his word we should never take this for granted we should never take his word for granted you think about Paul what he went through uh, many many people lost their lives because of under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit penning the scriptures as we have them uh, today. A physical manifestation of God to us. All the scriptures here point us to God and the things of God and what he calls us to do. And so he's going to call us to do some difficult things in these last days. We need to stop loving ourselves. We need to kind of do a, a bit of a self assessment and we need to really pray and ask God, what does he want us to do? We talked last week. I know I said I was going to close, but I'm, I'm still talking. We talked last week about praying for, someone, for God to lead someone in your path this week to share the gospel with or the things of God. I want you to think about that. Pray specifically that God would put someone in your path between now and next Wednesday to share the gospel with doesn't have to be a, a seven-page sermon or a study of scripture. It can be as simple as a, a track. It can be simple as just inviting them to church, but a gospel opportunity to share Christ with someone. And prayerfully, I hope someone will be able to share a specific opportunity next week during the beginning portion of our service of how God gave you an opportunity to share Christ with others. Less than 10% of the church shares their faith with somebody on a consistent basis. Statistically, 90% of believers do not share their faith at all. Let's be part of that 10% of sharing Christ with someone this week. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. <clears throat> we just thank you how powerful it is in our lives. We love ourselves too much. I love myself too much. Help us to get our heads out of the clouds and see the needs of others as Paul did, as Timothy did, as Titus did, as those who were strong in their faith gave us great examples on how to act during these last days. There's a lot of characteristics that we looked at tonight, God, and they were very heavy. We ask that you would help us not to be Fond of silver, as Paul talked about, covetous. Help us not to boast. The only things that we should be boasting in is what you have done for us. Help us to have the proper affection for our family relationships. It's just so easy to be connected to our devices these days, God. Help us to set those aside and sit eye to eye, knee to knee with our kids, with our spouses, and really reestablish the connection that you desire for us to have. And God, we pray that as we grow in our faith in Christ, we know that you, there is that promise that if we live godly in you, we are going to suffer some sort of persecution. Help us to be, as Pastor talked about on Sunday, bold as a lion. The righteous are bold as a lion. We pray for boldness this week. We pray that when you do give us that opportunity to share Christ with others, you give us that answer to prayer, that we would obey the Holy Spirit. If, if you need to give us creative ways to share our faith, God, please, please instruct us to do so. Please help us to seize that opportunity 
not because we want to glory in ourselves and be able to just give some testimony next week for our own glory, but ultimately, God, our only to give glory to you, and we just praise your holy name. We just thank you for the righteousness that we have in you, and we're just so thankful for this church. We ask for safety as we uh, go home, and Lord willing that you bring us back Sunday to continue the great fellowship here, the edification of each other, building each other up uh, to spread your word and uh, multiply your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great evening.